Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BB3D channel we'll take a look at the Ender 3 S1 Pro. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BB3D. This episode of the BB3D channel is brought to you in part by these awesome channel members. Hi, welcome back! Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about 3D printing, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're taking a look at the Ender 3 S1 Pro. And if this printer looks really familiar, it should. I reviewed the Ender 3 S1 Not Pro about five or six months ago. This particular Ender 3 S1 Pro is courtesy of my friends at Pergear, just like the last one. Thank you, Pergear, for sending this over for review. So let's get right into the printer's specs. There's a lot that's the same between the Ender 3 S1 and the Ender 3 S1 Pro. I'll go over all the similarities and then I'll cover the differences. The Pro has the same build volume as the S1 at 220 millimeters on the X axis, 220 millimeters on the Y axis, and 270 millimeters on the Z axis. It also has the same magnetic build plate and a spring steel sheet with a print surface. And like the Ender 3 S1, the Pro has a CR Touch mesh bed leveling probe and a direct drive extruder with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which Creality calls the Sprite. The Pro has the same 32-bit mainboard as the Ender 3 S1 with the same full-sized SD card slot, the same USB port for printing directly from your computer or from a Raspberry Pi running Octoprint. Oh, and Creality is still using ferrules on the high current wiring for better safety. Also, the Pro has the same dual Z-axis stepper motor configuration as the S1, complete with the belt at the top to keep both sides in sync. So let's see, same filament runout sensor, same belt tensioners on the X and Y axes, both printers have a tool drawer, and it comes with the same complement of tools and spare parts. Assembly of the Pro is exactly the same as the S1, and the included SD card has an excellent assembly video to show you how to do it, and how to get the bed leveled. Since those are covered pretty well in the videos on the card, I'm not going to cover them here. I think that's about it for the similarities. Time for the differences, which I guess are the things that make the Pro, Pro. On the Pro, instead of a PC build surface, the spring steel sheet has a textured PEI surface. And the bed can handle a bit more heat now with a maximum temperature of 110 degrees Celsius. Speaking of handles, the bed has one of those too. Also on the Pro, the Sprite Direct Drive Extruder uses an all-metal hot-end design. That means no more PTFE liner in the hot zone. That also means a maximum settable temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. And that opens up the possibility of printing with more kinds of materials. Yes, you may need to add an enclosure to help hold in the warmth for those materials that are prone to warping. But now you can experiment with more filament types and that's always fun. So let's see, what else is different? Oh yeah, Creality included a light bar already installed on the top of the gantry. And the tool drawer is actually larger on the Pro, which is nice. The case design is different as well. The color screen and knob from the S1 has been replaced with a nice color touchscreen on the Pro with a different user interface. It has a few little quirks and it's taken me a little bit to get used to it, but when I say it's really nice, I mean it's really nice. Super sharp and easy to read from any angle. And the spool holder? Wow, this is the best spool holder I've ever seen on a 3D printer. Honestly, I never thought I'd be saying that in a review, but here we are. It's got bearings in it and when the spool turns, it's smooth. Okay, now let's get a look at the print quality. I loaded up some Polymaker Polyterra Sapphire Blue PLA. And the very first thing I printed was one of the pre-sliced files on the card that came with the printer. This was the Lucky Cat model. This thing came out amazing, not a defect to be found. Now I still have Creality Slicer installed from when I got the regular Ender 3S1, so I sliced and printed a 3D Benchy, and this came out really good too. And I also sliced and printed Luby 3D's Aria Dragon, also a beautiful print. Then I loaded some Polymaker Polylite Red PETG and printed one of my desktop trash cans. I'm pleased with how it turned out. And by the way, these are a great place to put skirts and priming lines and other little bits of stuff that tend to collect around your 3D printer. 
So I did a few prints in TPU, too. I printed the Lucky Cat again, and this came out really nice, but I have to say it's not as squishy as I hoped it would be. So then I printed a TPU case for my iPhone, and that's squishier, and 100% functional, too. And for maximum squishiness, I thought it might be fun to print my desktop trash can in TPU, too. Now, this one I had going a little too fast for the material. It started out okay, but as it got taller, it was squishier and easier for the nozzle to push around. I noticed it starting to look a little rough, so I slowed it down to 50% speed, and from that point, the print looks great. And it's super squishy. After that, I printed a Calicat in some Polymaker Polylite ASA. Now, this is one of those materials that needs heat and lots of it. I printed it at 250 degrees Celsius on a 90 degree bed, and I had a hard time getting it to stick to this textured PEI surface. I asked 3D Print General what he uses to get ASA to stick, and he wholeheartedly recommend Magigoo. But I don't have any Magigoo, so I had to give it a little swipe of glue stick instead. So anyway, the glue stick worked to keep the Calicat's feet held down. Mostly. It did apparently have a bit of a toe curling experience. Now, this is my first ever print with ASA, and, and in my opinion, the result was pretty good, even though there was a tiny bit of warping on the Calicat's feet. I think ASA needs an abundance of warmth and a lack of drafts in order to achieve best results, and an open frame printer is kind of the opposite of that. One final print. I wanted to go tall, so I printed Aria again, scaled up to 200% size. At this size, she's 260 millimeters tall, just under the maximum 270 millimeter build height of the printer. This was printed with a nice color gradient silk filament, so it goes from a metallic green at the base up to a metallic purplish color. It's really nice. Well, now let's get into a couple of feature tests. Just like last time on the Ender 3S1, I'm going to test the power loss recovery and filament runout sensor. I started printing an XYZ calibration cube and let it get about 10 minutes into the print. Then I turned off the printer's power switch. After a few seconds, I turned it back on. And the printer booted. And that was it. So even though Creality's product page for the Ender 3S1 Pro says it's got power loss recovery, so that's the resume printing feature shown here, it doesn't. I looked through all the menus on the screen and there's not even a setting for it. Okay then. Well, next it's time to see how the filament runout sensor works. If I cut the filament during a print, is the printer going to tell me that I need to run out and get some more? Yes, I'm going to make that joke pretty much every chance I get. Come for the printer reviews, stay for the dad jokes. Don't worry, you get used to it. Okay, so I started printing another calibration cube and I let it get part way done. Then I cut the filament. Once the filament sensor notices the lack of filament, it parks the print head at the back left corner of the bed and the printer shows a message on the screen indicating that it's out of filament. So I loaded the filament again and told the printer to continue the print and it did the right thing. And the cube finished up just fine. I tested the thermal safety features the same way I did on the Ender 3 S1 Not Pro video by unplugging the heater cartridge while the printer was at temperature, which simulated a situation where the printer wasn't able to maintain the nozzle at a desired temperature. As expected on a printer with thermal safety features working, the printer showed an error and had to be powered off and on again to reset it. So that's working like I expected. Okay, we've done safety checks, covered printer specs, and looked at some prints. Now it's time to cover the things I like and don't like about the Ender 3 S1 Pro. First, the things I don't like. Just like the Ender 3 S1, the Ender 3 S1 Pro failed at power loss recovery. However, it failed differently because the feature is simply missing from the unit I received. Even though I generally don't rely on the power loss recovery feature, this should be easy for Creality to fix with a firmware update. The fan noise is on par with the Ender 3S1, so nothing's really changed there. It's quieter than some printers, louder than others, but it's not horrible. And there's really not a whole lot that I dislike about this thing. As for things I like, well, I like the light bar. It's super convenient and it's powered by the auxiliary plug at the right rear corner of the printer. I think there was a missed opportunity to be able to control it from the LCD, since that port supposedly supports PWM, 
pulse width modulation, which would allow the main board to control the brightness of the light. But on the other hand, I appreciate that I don't have to dig around through the menu system when I can just reach up and hit the switch to turn it on or off. I also like the look of it even more so than I did the Ender 3 S1, and I like that one real well. Where the Ender 3 S1 had an injection molded front bezel, the Ender 3 S1 Pro's entire lower body shell is injection molded. It's nicely sculpted and has a premium appearance. It does still have an aluminum extrusion frame inside, so it's sturdy. I like the even bigger than the S1's drawer, and I like the full-size SD card slot, but the card does still go in upside down. But that's because the main board is upside down in the printer. And to be fair, the boards in many, many printers are mounted exactly like this, so it's really common. <laughs> you know, one of these days, an electronics component manufacturer is going to make a card slot mechanism that's upside down compared to the ones currently available. And then we're going to get a printer where the card goes in right side up, and as a group, we're going to lose our minds over it because we've been conditioned for years to put the cards in upside down. Well, anyway, I like the full-size cards because they are a lot easier to handle and to insert and remove from the printer. The Sprite extruder with the all-metal design is definitely welcome, although honestly, I think it should have been on the original S1 as well. Now, all these extras that the Pro comes with come at an extra cost as well. For people who don't have a lot to spend, there's the option of starting out at the low end of the Ender 3 product line and performing upgrades as their time, budget, and skill level allow. And all the upgraded functional features that the Ender 3 S1 Pro has, you can eventually add to a base Ender 3. If you're the kind of person that likes to tinker, this is a fun way to add features without having to pay for all those features up front. Just add as you go and as you feel the need. But for people who do want all the upgraded features and who don't like the idea of doing the upgrades themselves, they can get the Ender 3 S1 Pro and not have to worry about it. Either option is rewarding in its own way. So that's the Ender 3 S1 Pro. In my opinion, the Ender 3 S1 Pro is a good choice if you need the extras that it comes with. It's the top of the Ender 3 line with a premium feature set, and it looks good too. I think it's the nicest Ender 3 I've ever used. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. And now that we're at the end, let's go print something cool. Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end, and thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares. And an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you like this episode, a thumbs up would be great, and if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways you could do exactly that. And hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It's absolutely free and it's an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BV3D channel.